And it got so quiet. <laughs> Good evening. How wonderful to see all of you here on this evening for this wonderful event. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School here at Union. And I am so pleased to welcome you to the book launch for Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World of course, written by my dear sister friend, Reverend Dr. Serene Jones. <laughs> this book, Call It Grace, is filled with very personal stories that take us from Serene's Oklahoma upbringing to her time as president here at Union. Through the sharing of these stories, she takes us on a theological journey of faith. For as she shares experiences that were life-changing for her, and at times painful and traumatic, she speaks and asks of her faith, a faith shaped by Calvinistic Protestantism, she asks, how is one to understand, for instance, forgiveness? How is one to understand God's law? How is one to understand even God's justice when encountering hateful and or racist violence? And how in the world are we under to understand the grace of God in a world where it seems all too often that God is not. In this book, Serene takes us through her journey to understand the meaning of her faith in a world that leaves us fractured. A theological journey that brings all of us closer to understanding perhaps our own faith. And so, it is not simply a privilege, but it is with gratitude that I introduce to you this evening the first woman president of this venerable Union Theological Seminary, as well as a respected scholar who occupies the Johnston Family Chair for Religion and Democracy and past president of the American Academy of Religion. I present to you the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones. So I will uh, say a little more as the evening moves forward, but right off the bat, I just wanted to say a word of thanks to uh, very important people. Um, first, Kelly, thank you for that. That was wonderful. We have the delight of having offices next door to one another filled with lots of laughter and constant conversation. And um, to the panelists, um, you have in me and Eddie and David, the past three presidents of the AAR, which means you have three people who spent many nights having drinks together after interminable meetings <laughs> and um, got to know each other very well. And then Jackie, a dear friend in New York City, and uh, um, I remember us going around uh, doing news show after news show around Black Lives Matters, and it's grown since then. So. Um, I want to say thank you to Gloria Loomis, who at the last minute couldn't be here, who's my agent. Um, a special thanks to um, Carolyn Calhoun, Amy's son, Micah Parsons, um, Jody West, Robin. Robin, where are you? Are you in the back? Come sit down up here. 
um, Robin Reese, uh, Ben Perry, um, Virginia Fisher. These are all people who behind the scenes did all the work to make tonight possible, but now for two years have made so much of the work of this book possible. I want to say thanks to Brian Tart uh, from Viking, who was not just the publisher of this book and the president of Viking, but he actually edited every page of the book and gave me feedback as I wrote, which is a very rare thing to find in a publisher um, these days. And I was very fortunate to have that. Um, I want to say a, a special word of thanks to Kelly Brown Douglas and Fred Davey. Um, Fred is right here, who's the executive vice president at Union. Um, and they read the first draft of this book when I was terrified that I had even written such a book, and um, I knew they would be honest with me, and uh, their encouragement has meant the world. Uh, a big thanks to Betty Sue Flowers and Bill Bradley, who also read early versions. And I'll tell you, if you ask an en uh, English professor to read your manuscript, it's amazing the detail of comments that you get back. So Betty Sue, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to Shepard Parsons, Karen Klein, and Iris and Eli Parsons, who have been supportive of this work for a long time, I would say 23 years. Um, and also uh, Roseanne, thank you for your support for the book, Roseanne Gold. So about 15 years ago, uh, when I first got the idea for this book, the name of it was it was a terrible name, but it's kind of catchy. But it was Jesus and the Jones Girls. <laughs> and as someone said to me, that sounds a little bit like Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys. <laughs> um, but what that title captured was I had a strong desire to write about the faith of the women in my family, which this book does. Um, now, there's two very important women, my two sisters, uh, Kendi and Verity, who could not be here tonight. Um, but my third sister, my cousin Krista, is. So, Krista, I'm so happy you're here. Krista Jones, um, one of the Jones girls, and Craig Stinson. Uh, both are here from Edmond, Oklahoma, so some real Okies are in the house. Um, and then the Jones girl that I know best um, is uh, Karis Augusta Parsons Jones, my daughter, who turned 23 yesterday. And uh, her name uh, is Greek for grace. And she's the light that keeps on shining. Um, and then I also had the great delight as I wrote this book. Um, I'll tell you more about what, what happened in writing this book. But as this book began to pour out of me, with sort of great fury and speed, um, my partner, Gary Zarr, also started pouring out a brilliant novel. Um, and we finished them both about the same time. Um, and it, it's quite an experience of grace to um, have a, a grace-filled writing companion at that kind of moment. So, uh, And Emily and Glenn, it's great to have you here. So thank you. Um, and then lastly, even though he's not here, He's probably sitting at his computer trying to figure out how to live stream. He's upset that he got on Amazon today and couldn't find, figure out how to order books. Um, but the book is dedicated to my father, uh, Joe Jones, who is in Epworth Villa Retirement Center in Oklahoma City. So dad, if you figured out how to get on the live stream, which I highly doubt, but if you're there, <laughs> thank you for this book. Um, as I say at the very end of the book, um, these people I have named are more of me than I am of myself, um, which is true about those people in our lives that make us, and it is at the heart of what grace is, so thank you. Thank you. Well, so we are here tonight and have gathered together quite a distinguished panel to have a discussion of this book as we launch this book uh, this evening at Union Theological Seminary. And so with us this evening is Dr. Eddie Glaub, who is chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, a scholar and author who addresses the issues of black and blue in America. 
He has, is the author of many books, two of which of his well-known books include Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism in the Politics of Black America. Like Serene, and as Serene mentioned, he is past president of the American Academy of Religion, and many of you will recognize him uh, as a regular contributor on MSNBC, particularly Morning Joe. Uh, to, uh, what, a, what better way to wake, wake, uh, wake up huh? and welcome our morning? But I would like to welcome uh, Eddie here this evening, great scholar and friend. Seems to be a theme with this AAR thing tonight. For our next panelist is Reverend Dr. David Gushy, who is the immediate past president of the Academy. He joins us from Mercer University in Georgia, where he is the distinguished professor of Christian ethics and director of the Center for Theology and Public Life, a leading Christian ethicist and author of the recently released book, Moral Leadership for a Divided Age, 14 People Who Dared to Change Our World. David also happens to be a Union alum. So welcome back. And then, of course, last but certainly not least, is the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, who is, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. She is senior minister at Middle Collegiate Church, a multi-ethnic, welcoming, and inclusive church here in New York City. She is an activist and advocate for racial equality, economic justice, and LGBTQ gender equality, a public theologian, Jackie is, as well, a frequent contributor on MSNBC and serves on the advisory committee for the Women's March. She is senior fellow at Auburn Theological Seminary. Welcome, Jackie. Perhaps in ways beyond our planning, it is not fortuitous that we would be gathered here tonight to discuss this book, Call It Grace. For it was 167 years ago today, March 20th, 1869, that Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was released. Through her novel, as a white Christian woman, Stowe hoped to engage people in a conversation to heal a country divided over the issue of slavery. But in so doing, she told a story that perpetuated the myths of white supremacy and avoided the truths of slavery, and most especially of what it meant to be white and Christian in a time of slavery. And now we gather here, some 167 years later, to launch a book that dares to wrestle with the story of what it means to be white, female, and Christian in a time when the embers of slavery and fires of white supremacy still burn. This is a story that Harriet Beecher Stowe could not and would not tell. Yet this is the story that must be told if ever we are to heal the divisions that are slavery's legacy in this country if not in our churches. And so this discussion tonight is more than academic. The book, Call It Grace, is not just for the scholarly. It is a book for such a time as this. And so Serene, as I thank you for writing this book, tell us, what is this book about? <laughs> And why a theological memoir? Um, so uh, we decided that we should do this question right off the bat because only the people up here and a few on the front row have read the book. So um, I need to tell you a little bit about it. First of all, um, when I sat down to write the book, I wanted to write a book about understandings of sin and grace at this particular political moment because of its understanding of the universality of human brokenness and the universality of deep uh, sacred dignity of everyone, of every person, um, that 
uh, that kind of moral and spiritual discourse um, at this political moment is absolutely necessary. I found the theologians I was going to use and uh, small stories from my own life to um, illuminate them. And then I sat down to write the book. It was going to address political issues like white supremacy, racism, um, se sexual abuse, um, capitalism, um, white domestic terrorism, um, issues related to families and intimacy. And I sat down to write the book and instead of a theological explication, these stories came pouring out of me. And I found I could not talk about either the issues or about grace without talking about my own life. And what was particularly important for me is that um, that as a white woman, um, I couldn't be pushing uh, white Christians to deal, not just politically, but step back from that inside their own family histories with the legacies of white supremacy if I could not do that myself. So this book in its early chapters tells a horrible story about a lynching in 1911 in my grandfather's um, hometown of Okima, Oklahoma, a woman named Laura Nelson. At that point in time, there were maybe 300 people in that town. Half of them were my relatives, and there's, there's no way my family was not a part of that. Um, and I, I wrestle with that legacy in the book. Um, I also wrestle with, as a young girl, um, his um, sexual harassment and assault on his own grand, many cousins and granddaughters. Um, and this is going back in time um, to issues in the present, but that have been in our families and our histories for a long time. I might also tell a story about my first trip outside of the United States to India, where I had my, I didn't, wouldn't have called it at the time, but a mystical experience uh, when I almost died from amoebic dysentery. Um, but what it means to confront and live in another culture, uh, so radically different, and then to question one's faith in a deep, rattling way because of that. I tell the story of the bombing of the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. Uh, my uh, then brother-in-law was across the street. My sister, uh, Kendi, um, was working, um, is now one of the deputy attorney generals for the state, but was, uh, had been doing anti, uh, cap she was doing capital cases against the death penalty. Um, and he was injured. Our family was very involved. She was, her, they were one of the few families that spoke out against the death penalty at the time as themselves having been victims um, of, the, of the violence. And then as it turned out, he ended up being sent to Terre Haute, Indiana for execution where my other sister, Verity, was the pastor of the largest church in Terre Haute, which had itself become an anti-death penalty church and was there when he was executed protesting. And then I have a final section where I talk about almost losing Karis when she was six months old to an a, a, um, anaphylactic reaction and my own almost losing my life to cancer. Um, I talk about being the president of this place and then I end with a story um, that uh, is the story of my mother who died three years ago, who in the last months of her life revealed first to me, then to my sisters, then to my fathers, then to all of the nurses in the nursing home, then to the doctors, then to everyone from church who came to visit, then to everyone from her high school who came from the reunion, and the circle got bigger and bigger. But she revealed that she had had a, a seven-year affair um, with a very close family friend and uh, and she was it came out very angrily and she used it to to try to destroy my father and then she died um, so the last chapter of the book is about my father who is a minister um, a brilliant theologian a professor of theology uh, having been a dean and a president of a school and his serious uh, loss of faith and wrestling with that um, so those are some of the moments that we'll probably hear referred to tonight. But throughout all of that, the theme of the structural collective character of sin and how it 
affects our lives in profound ways, even when we're not aware of it, even if it's not an individual act. And then what it means to actually, in the midst of that, confirm our ultimate destiny in love, our ultimate belovedness, and the political force of that affirmation. Thank you. When I first opened this book, I didn't quite know what to expect from a title, Call It Grace. And I thought, oh, here we go, a systematic theology about grace. Uh, and the nature of grace and, and the history of theologians who have talked about the meaning of grace. But that's not what I found. I found someone who was deeply wrestling with their faith. It was theology, faith-seeking understanding, as Anselm says, in a profound way. So the book surprised me. So I'd like to ask the panelists, starting with Eddie, how did you receive the book? What surprised you about the book? Well, thank you for, Kelly, for that wonderful introduction and framing of, of this discussion. I'm so delighted to be here with you and to share in the gift that Sister Serene has given us. I, couldn't have missed, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Uh, and it's a delight to be um, on the panel with each of you and to um, share in this launching. So. Well, I received the book through the mail. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I was going to say UPS. Um, what struck me is or, a couple of things. One is that Serene theologizes through experience in the text. That she teaches, instructs uh, by way of an account of corporal experience, right? The text, the, one of the underlying uh, features of the book for me is wounded flesh, to echo Hortense Spillers. And what does it mean to kind of begin to, to, to begin the theological project on that ground of wound? whether it's the wound of Doug Jones's masking, whether it's the wound of your mother's anger um, and feeling of unfulfillment and displacing that onto her children and to the people around her, the lists of punishment to dole out to people who, whomever, the blue shoes, that were behind the car door. I'm sorry, you gotta read it. I'm just looking at the These two. Um, but, but the idea, so, so for me to kind of begin to think about breath, justice, mercy, love, not as abstractions, but as ideas that emerge out of a wounded self trying in some way to deal with the wound, but not in some ways falling into the idolatry of the pursuit of wholeness, right? but to reside in the brokenness and to think about what does it mean to imagine one's relationship to God, one's relationship to mystery in the midst of the brokenness. So that's what came out of the book for me. And I got a couple of other things at some point to say. Good old return to some of these things. David. It is uh, truly an honor to be a part of this conversation and to have been invited to this panel. Um, I, I just um, could not put this book down once I started reading it. Uh, it is a tour de force in a, a couple of different ways. Um, it is one of the most bracingly honest and self-revealing books that I can recall reading. Mm -hmm. You, Serene, do not hide anything. You, you tell your story in all of its woundedness and fracturedness, um, but then you connect your story to communal stories, especially your relationships in your family and then back to Oklahoma and so you are a person who has a, an identity rooted in family and place, but there are wounds all through it, but also grace all through it. 
so the storytelling, there are stories in this book that when you read it, you will never forget these stories. You will feel like you know the people. And um, uh, like the story, I mean, among the many stories, the story when you almost lost your daughter to peanut butter uh, and the way you, um, uh, the way you described that, it brought me to tears. Um, the other thing is the way you gently theologize your life. And I think we live in a time in which theology has hardly ever seemed less relevant to the way people think about their lives. In a great number of our churches, there is no meaningful theology that seems to be shaping people's uh, visions of life or living of life. In public life, theology appears far, far away. Uh, you make people like uh, Calvin and, and um, Bart and all kinds of other uh, people uh, living and dead uh, come alive. You show the significance. How about this? It seems to me in your memoir that without theological resources, you might have been broken by your life. But instead, theology helped you to, to live your life and to find um, a way forward. And isn't that something? Maybe theology really does matter. Um, can I just say one other thing? There's a, there's a central character in this book, and that's you. And learning about your journey is fascinating, and what I would say is call it grace, but I would also say call it toughness, too. There's a tough woman in this book, um, curled up on a train platform in India, um, battling cancer, dealing with every kind of grief, um, including in the struggles here, all of which you're very honest about. So there's a toughness in, this is not soft grace, this is, this is a resilient, tough human being, but for whom divine grace has been sustaining. So it's just a beautiful book. What a pleasure it is to go last. Um, I want to say, uh, first of all, just to Serene, I am extraordinarily jealous that you got this book out of your body. Uh, I've got a theological memoir that's been growing in my body for eight years, so I hope it'll come out next year, like the nine-year gestation period. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Um, we were just upstairs in your office talking about um, James Baldwin and how some of us have given Baldwin to folks to read, to think about picturesque writing or cinematic writing. I would say this is a book to read, to think about cinematic picturesque writing. Um, I'm, I'm particularly, I will never forget you with your foot on the stone in the playground, wanting to hurt your foot because your mother's gonna hurt you because you've lost the watch. And red stretch shorts, right? Just all the detail. So that's just beautiful. It is a really beautiful work of art, is what I want to say. And, you know, my um, discipline is theology and religion. So psychology and religion, psychology and religion. I think I'm struck, uh, Serene, here in this book, as I was in Trauma and Grace, your psychological insight, that you are able to move in a really deft and beautiful and powerful way between what is theological and what is psychological. And I think it opens up something different in a, in a culture where we try to separate mind and heart or science and religion or there can be no such thing as pastoral psychology because that's, that's not where we're at. So there's um, academic rigor, there's poignant and vulnerable storytelling, and there's really keen insights about humanity. But I think that's why the, theolo for me, that's why the theology 
is soaring. There's a way in which you deliver it as something that can heal our souls and, and heal our minds, make our minds right. So that sense of the personal sin and the systemic sin that is the thing that we're all swimming in right now, that is white supremacy, um, a window into your own story, Serene, that lets us take a look at our own stories. I just received it as um, an interdisciplinary gift for someone like me who makes my living preaching to folks and, and trying to uh, help them to find their way into a God that will heal them. It's, it's just beautiful. So in hearing, yeah, right. <laughs> and seen. <laughs> right. But in listening to your responses that speak very well to the book that uh, this book is more than just a skimming of somebody's life. It's more than just a surface reflection of somebody's life. But in this book, in this book, Serene, you really open up your soul and you think deeply and reflect deeply about very personal experiences. You make yourself vulnerable. What allowed you to be so vulnerable in this book? Um, well, I would say first years of therapy. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, and a community, um, it, I would not have been able to write this book if I had not had the support of the people who love me and who I write about. Um, and uh, above all, uh, my father's blessing on this book. Um, since he's the person most affected by all of the stories, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So it, it says something about the courage that comes and the vulnerability that is allowed by a sense of, at the, at the very most intimate level, a sense of safety. Um, but um, secondly, I, I'm at a point in my life, I'm turning 60 this summer, and I'm... I'm so just exhausted by white people who at one level can talk abstractly about things like white supremacy and Me Too and the problems of capitalism and a critique of our country, but in terms of actually claiming their own history and legacy and place in the critiques they make, it, it, it sounds hollow when it comes to actually the hard work of social change. And so um, uh, it, it was so interesting to me. I was uh, preaching um, about this book in Birmingham about six weeks ago at a very um, renowned, uh, well-heeled white Presbyterian church and told the story of this awful lynching of Laura Nelson and her son Abel. And it was fascinating to me afterwards that person after person said to me, I'm so sorry you have that history in your family. <laughs> As if they don't. As if they, and I, and I would say, you know, now, and are, are you from Birmingham? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and how long have you lived here? Oh, my whole my life. Oh, and how many generations? Oh, I go back six generations. And I was sort of like, you know, uh, we have this incredible memorial now to the history of lynching, but we have no story in this country of what created the lynchers. That is a part of the story, which is horrific, but it needs detailed analysis and deep probing for us to really get a handle on why it is that white supremacy and racism is so deeply entrenched. Um, and one of the lessons of this book, I learned um, in a conversation um, with uh, our friend Farrah Griffin in, um, over lunch um, that the uh, Columbus Circle Memorial um, is a memorial that was built um, 
in honor, in memory of the largest single lynching that happened in the United States, which was the lynching of 30 Italians in New Orleans. Um, now, how many of us know that story about our own city of New York and that history in this country? Um, so, but those aren't just abstracted histories, they live in our bodies. And I think, Eddie, when you talked about the, the woundedness, those, I've also been reading a lot about epigenetics and what does it mean from generation for generation for these sins to quite literally be passed down and to live inside of us. And if you're not going to be vulnerable to enough to look at those, they're never going to go away. And collectively, we're going to be stuck in the prison that we've been creating for centuries. So one of the things you do in this book is, is to tell the truth of your story, which is a wider truth. And, uh, and so I turn to the panel. I say at such a time as this, we have a book like this, but is this a time where we need more books like this? How will we ever get to the truth of who we are as a nation and as a people, let alone the truth of who we ought to be uh, in terms of sort of the theological call and, and, and uh, uh, theological story. But is this theological memoir, is this the kind of book we need at such a time as this? Why is this book important? We're constantly telling ourselves lies, you know? Yep. There's a moment in, on page 196 in the text where she cites Howard Thurman. And in a way, it's, an, it's, a, it's a citation about the disaster of the private life that then evidences itself in the, in the public life. And it seems to me that it, you know, we're constantly uh, uh, failing to engage in an honest reckoning. You know, one of the interesting things about the book, I mean, we, I love Serena, I love the book. The one interesting thing about the book is that it goes silent when it comes to the t moment where the, how Doug Jones was buried. What happened to him in death? And Doug Jones haunts this text in interesting sorts of ways. Cherokee background, but white as snow, right? The jokes you heard around the kitchen table. Um, even when your father was spat upon and you learned that amazing lesson of grace in that experience, there was still the birthday celebration and what came out of your mouth and how you gave voice to it. So there's something about the revelation of, of, of how, what happens in those private domains that shape who we are, that, that inform our choices, our desires, our hopes, uh, how those wounds move us about. And you know, no matter how, how can I put this? And no matter how you build the trenches to get the water to flow away from you, it's like the Mississippi River, it's just gonna flood. It's just going to come back and hit you, you know? And so there's this, there's what, what is needed is a deep honesty about who we actually are. But we have a whole host of rituals to keep us from actually having that encounter. So, and I add to that question, I let uh, the panel can uh, address with these. So then who ought to read this book? Who, who, right, <laughs> right. So who, right. <laughs> I just want I just wanted to hear you say it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll answer the well, everybody should read this book, um, but I'll answer the earlier question about theological memoir. I think that I, I wrote I myself wrote a memoir in 2017, and I think it was because partly because I felt like I had come to the end of myself in terms of regular academic prose. That um, regular academic prose and the games that academics play, I write the scholarly article or book for other academics and peer review and, and all of that, 
um, is self-hiding rather than self-revealing a lot of times, and it's part of an academic game that reinforces certain kinds of elite academic culture that often deflects us from dealing with the realities that we really need to deal with. And I also have felt, and I come out of the white evangelical world, I have felt that 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 particular world, as it descends into an increasingly anti-Jesus posture and a political loyalty that strikes me as the antithesis of what it ought to be, that more radical measures are required to even speak in such a way that one might be able to be heard, these feel more like apocalyptic times. These are not ordinary times. An ordinary academic game playing we, don't, we can't afford it. And so it seems to me that uh, novels and memoirs and poetry and other kinds of ways of communicating that, that are more self-revealing and more raw and more real uh, are what we need right now. I, I agree with that. When you asked that question, Kelly, I thought, well, I think the Bible is spiritual memoir. Uh, the Quran is spiritual memoir. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the, in, a, in a good way, Midrash is spiritual memoir. Um, I think the Jewish, our Jewish colleagues understand more, have a, a better kind of understanding and expectation that there's this text, and then there's this text about the text, and then there's what the old rabbis said about the text, and what the new rabbis say about the old rabbis. And all of this is this beautiful Midrash, this beautiful texting that writes our lives, that script for life, that shapes us, right? And we Christians, who definitely worship our Bible in the closing of the canon, um, don't have enough of that kind of text, that kind of memoir, wrestling with the, with the God we, we inherited, creating a new God for ourselves to love, um, perhaps in the image of the, of the better one. So I think we need spiritual memoir. I think all of us need to be writing spiritual memoir in conversation with each other, um, interrogating our lives. Um, uh, th you know, there's lots of ways to think about identity development, but I think one of them is that we're storied people. We're people of the book. And so the stories shape us, they make us, they change us. We can change ourselves when we change the story. And so Serene's book and other memoirs that I've read that really move me, um, it's like a window opening up into um, an another way to see your own life. Uh, to, and I want to play with the word text, but to, to write your own life, to rewrite your own life, to authorize your own life. And yes, white folks need to read it, but I think black people need to read white people memoirs too. Um, there's a way in which um, we're so darn polarized and so siloed. To hear each other's stories um, grows empathy, uh, grows understanding. And um, perhaps that's why we've had such a seg segregated America, Kelly. It's because the, the powers that be don't want us to be like each other, to have empathy for one another, uh, to come to understand each other more fully and you know, really have a revolution where we kick the powerful's butts. So this is like growing community, is what I want to say. And we need more of that. Even children in fifth grade need to be taught how to write their way mm -hmm. to, out of their story and into a new one. You know, I think it's really important, though, that we, we understand how memoir is functioning in our current moment. So memoir can stand in for history in a very dangerous way. So folk read between the world and me and think they got the history of black folk in the country. That's right. Right? That's right. And so memoir can work in a way to kind of flatten, can hide and obscure nuance and allow us to kind of reproduce a kind of narcissism that we see evidenced in the White House, right? Where everything is a kind of re micro reality show. I'm gonna tell you my story, I'm gonna project my pain and by virtue of that, I'm gonna project my brand. You pay attention to me, 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 me. For some reason, I felt like Cornell West right there. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, me, 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 me. Right, right. But the beautiful thing about Serene's memoir is that it turns, it goes inward as a precondition to go outward. 
So the, the end is not here. The end is out there. So, so there is this kind of move in which your story is important because it's always, you're always, the danger is always to slip into a kind of preoccupation with one's, one's own pain, right? But the pain becomes a kind of synecdochic move to get us to see how the country itself is not facing this or is facing that. And that's a really important intervention in how memoirs at their best work because we're kind of drowning in a different, other, another kind of way in which a preoccupation with the self it defines our moment. And I think, uh, just as I think even David said earlier, one of the uh, things that even begins the story is, Serene's story, is that it is always told within context of history, but within context of wider community. And so that we even began to realize how none of us are shaped apart from particular communities and how communities shape us and how history shapes us and how history lives in us, which becomes an important reason to tell the story. Uh, and so it helps us to understand the history. This book is called Call It Grace, and we haven't talked about grace yet. So what is this thing of grace? Serene. Um, well, it's uh, just a, an aside note. I, I was thinking about the book the other day and realized that it's a book about grace, but it's also a book about sin. It is really deeply mm -hmm. a book about sin. Yeah, no, the Calvinist in me just comes pouring out. But it is a, it is serious reflection on the collective nature of human brokenness. Um, which is why, for me, grace becomes such an important notion. And it is the core of my own belief, and that is that, that humanity and the world and the universe exists in, um, in the reality of, of, of divine belovedness. And for me, it's divine belovedness but it, one doesn't have to believe that it is divine to affirm the ultimate final word, uh, to use a theological term, ontological reality of the belovedness of every, every life. And that has huge political consequences. Um, I can't think of a more, uh, for me, political notion than the notion of, of grace. And what's so radical about it is the valuation of every individual and our planet um, comes not because it's earned. It has no basis in merit. It, you can't, there's no um, commodity capitalism. There's no grading system. There's no caste system that's generating the value. It simply is. You are beloved. Um, and the challenge of our lives is to actually believe that and open our eyes to it and see what that means in reality for how you experience the world around you. Can I comment yes. on it? I think, I think that's right. And I was really struck screen by the, I don't know, you called God the creator, redeemer, and consummator. Um, something about the, the divine love consummating the the, the creation that we're supposed to be and the, uh, the space between the who we're supposed to be and who we are not yet as sin. And this, I don't know, listening to the, to the anger in the world, the violence in the world, watching people shot dead in their houses of worship. In a brokenhearted way, I want to say, we don't pay enough attention to how that affects the soul, how that affects the self. So I think I love what Eddie's saying about we don't want memoir to be selfish, but wouldn't it be really wonderful if we could create a people who would do more internal work, just more internal work? What, what, the, the darkness, the, the way you described ultimately got your mom's issue as despair. Mm -hmm. Like, would that someone in the world would have seen your mother and been able to say, oh, that's a despairing child, before she was a despairing mother, before she hurt your dad on the way out the door, you know? 
the, the, the place that we don't have enough time or energy or conversation or language to do that interior work. Because at the, at the root, I think, of the, of the one who looks at Trump and sees a hero and goes and kills Muslims is a dark and empty and horribly wounded soul. And so I love that uh, memoir pushes us to do our own interior work and to try to create language and opportunity for those kinds of self-examinations. David, I see you shaking your head. Um, I think that I, that's a yes. Uh, it's an agreement, though. Uh, just to, to go a little further, call it grace. But grace here is both a belief and an achievement, in a sense. Yeah. Um, an achievement sometimes, like to live in grace towards others, is an achievement through great suffering and difficulty. I really like how in the book you are very honest, for example, about how unforgiving you felt towards Timothy McVeigh, right? And um, the discussion of your divorce that was kind of paired with that, and and the the in a sense what the book shows is the value not just for the individual but for the world for people to work hard to get through their bitterness and pain and even hate to come out on the other side with justice and mercy and forgiveness when people actually do that it makes for better family life better community life better relationships so, I think what we're seeing in our public life is just, I will only mention Trump one time. You have a fundamentally unhealthy human being at the center of our national life who doesn't seem to know any of this, who is living in a different kind of reality. And we are all in a sense, being exposed to the unhealth on a daily basis. And some people are being discipled, you might say, by the unhealth to become like it. This is a good way to be in the world, narcissistic and vicious and so on. So, so you might say that one of the, the best resources of our faith traditions is that they for hundreds or thousands of years have been showing us a better way. And we need them now to show us a better way. This memoir helps us kind of be reminded of the better way because it is now, it's instantiated in a life and you're telling your story which becomes a microcosm and a, and a kind of an invitation for others to take a similar journey. Which leads me to the question, so how do we, bring grace to the public square, given the situation in which we now find ourselves living? I think, just really quickly, back to what David said, is that I also think, just like those beautiful pictures where there's a foreground and a background, you see a lady with, it looks like an old lady with a beard, but it's also a young woman with a hair. What, what this book is about isn't just the better way. It is that, but I think it's also at least opens us up to the critique, the reality that actually American religion has not been that good. It's kind of sucked. It's like terrible. The, 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 and I think it's, I think it's here. The, the little God that we've, that we've created, that we worshiped, that created a nation where I was, didn't matter and a lot of y'all didn't matter, um, that's American religion and I think Implicit in the what is grace and how we get there is a critique of what it isn't and How far we are away from our ideal. So how do we get to the public square? We got to be really badass honest in the public square and be willing to critique the God that we've created That's a mean little some bitch we've made <laughs> That doesn't like people and in the name of God anti-islamic in the name of God six Kill. In the name of God, Jews, anti-Semitism rising. In the name of God, Native Americans, marched after land. You know, in the name of God, I can't preach. 
So that's just what we have to do, is we have to be as honest as we're celebrating Serene here, vulnerable as she is, to turn our own lens on our own stuff and say, look, this doesn't really work that well. What if we did together? What if we created something better together? And how do we do that? And what is the role of the theologian? Eddie on TV. What is the role of, <laughs> right, 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 uh, of, of the church? Yeah. We've got to preach truth to, to do that. And how do you do that? You know, Serene's dad is a fascinating answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Because there's a moment in the text, we're in the book, where uh, the, the venom of your mother's behavior poisonous it was in terms of his spirit and there's a sense in which his faith is is shaken to the core and he goes quiet he goes silent now this is really important because the Jones girls are always worried about dad giving them a lecture at the table right that you for him to go silent something has really really happened here but he starts politically blogging he engages the world in a way that isn't framed or shaped by an elaborated theological position. That the moment in which Serene says that he's lost something, then she narrates what he's doing. Right? And it seems to me that over and over again in the text or in the book, there is the doing. There is the actual work of loving. There is the actual work of building life with other people, as wounded, as broken as we are. There's the actual work of trying to make a society that reflects a set of values that will ensure that our children and our children's children will not only be able to dream dreams, but to make those dreams a reality. And it's not overburdened by some elaborate theological apparatus. It is, it is allowing people to freaking breathe. It is instantiating justice in the world where everybody, no matter what your zip code, no matter who you love, no matter what color you are, no matter which, can in fact achieve the truth. It's about mercy. It's about love. None of that seems to me to require an elaborated and articulated theological vision. At the moment, her father seems as broken as possible. What does he, what is his response? He acts in the world. And so the answer, it seems to me, is to do. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, I wanted totally. to preach that it, it, here. You that did, you a great job. That, that I, I hope yeah, my father's it's listening. Due. It's due. That's awesome, Eddie. Yeah, we, you know, we have to, I mean, those of us who are doing churchy work or theological work or teaching students who do churchy work, theological work, I do feel like there's some kind of um, don't be political thing that's in the world or don't go out there in the world and, you know, get your holy act together right here and me and you and Jesus and we're all good. But honestly, it's in the streets where I think, you know, Serene started with Jackie and I running around MSNBC and talking about Black Lives Matter. We have to be in the streets a bit. Um, so I love your do. I think that we are constructing theology. I mean, as a womanist person, like we're, we're constructing theology in our stories, we're constructing theology in, our, in the way we raise our babies at the table, and I think we have to construct theology in the streets. Well, Vote. I, protest. And yeah. the other thing, both your comment and Eddie's and Serene's book does is it makes us realize that not only are we constructing theology, but whether we are aware of it or not, or own it, I shouldn't say own it or not, our lives are being shaped by certain theologies. Uh, uh, and so to even begin to at least uh, mind the theology that is shaping our very responses uh, to ourselves and to others and to the world. And that's one of the things that you do in this book, Serene, is that you unearth the theology that indeed your father handed down to you and some of the things that you rejected and some of the things that uh, you affirmed, but the way in which it shaped your whole sense of self and the way in which you engage the world. David, you wanted to comment. The, um, the question about how do we bring this into the 
public makes me um, think about this. I, I'm reading a lot of James Baldwin right now. A lot of people up here are reading a lot of James Baldwin right now, and um, he speaks so much to this moment. But in my Baldwin immersion, I'm constantly reminded of him saying basically that white people have constructed an identity based on this uh, made up uh, world that we created around race. Uh, we invented you know, whiteness, we invented a negative image, blackness, and then, and then told all kinds of lies to keep our, our, our mental construct and our identity uh, fixed. And then when that gets challenged, we fall apart. Um, and there's, there's one line I read, I guess it was today, something about uh, white people need help and healing, <laughs> he says. Um, so where does healing come from? It involves a, a level of depth encounter with our heritage and our history and our sin that is very difficult. Nobody really wants to do it. It's like in the early stage of like us becoming a more multiracial academy, it was like we congratulated ourselves if we, we hired a black person. Congratulations. Woo! Wow, we're on our way. The, the depth of naming the wrong, and I mean, that's hard enough. Just get the history right, right? But then to trace it in our own stories. So naming the wrong in one's own history, one's own neighborhood, one's own community. By the way, one of the amazing features of the new uh, museum, or the new anti-lynching memorial in Montgomery, is the lynchings are laid out by county. And those big, hor horrific kinds of, um, yeah, that hang from the ceiling. And so, so if you've lived in the South, as I have for my adult life, what you feel inclined to do is to go find your county or counties that you've lived in. And I did that when I was there a few weeks ago. And pretty much every county that I have lived in, there were lynchings. And, and then you want to find out, well, what actually happened that day? And why didn't anybody ever tell me? And so I think it's really significant that a, a lynching story is so central to your memoir, Serene. I think that lynching is central Dealing with lynching, lynching itself, is central to understanding and coming to terms with our history. And, um, and so I find myself wanting to probe more deeply my own heritage, my own memories, my own family history. And I, in a sense, what you've done is you've modeled that here. Healing will only come through a deep engagement, not a showy engagement, just a deep, honest engagement with that heritage. And confession. Like, just to, just to talk to white people, I was looking around, can I talk to white people? Just, like, how do we take it public? I mean, everybody isn't going to have a publisher who says, I would love to publish your memoir, and I'll get to be honest in, in public, so to speak. But I think in the private spaces, we have to be honest about what is happening in America. And the role we all play in it, the risk we have to take to name that, the way it's unpopular, the way people won't like us, the way we'll be angry because someone will think we're racist and we can make a mistake and whatever, but racism is the evil in America. It is the American sin. And so I think any honest writer would have to put that in the middle of a memoir. And so I'm glad Serene did. I just, just once, just the, there's a moment when I, um, I discover this family history. Um, I'm sitting in a classroom, and one of our friends is doing a presentation which has those horrific postcards of lynching showing on the screen, and, and one drops down, and it says, Laura Nelson, Okima, Oklahoma, 1911. And here I am, I'm in my 40s. And I just, it's like, it's like I've been punched in the gut, but it's like, I can no longer, it's, it's like, my, my family, they had to have done that. And it was suddenly, lynching was not something other white people did to other black people. It was something my people 
did to a person named Laura Nelson and her son Abel. And that just was sort of like the veil fell. I mean, literally, as the postcard fell. And then you, when I later found the full postcard, you see the whole town of Okima on the bridge above their bodies it, celebrating. And it's too blurry for you to get a sense so I can identify certain people, but um, there's, there's, it's in, in, it, Woody Guthrie's father led the lynch mob. And he wrote about that. And uh, the Guthrie's lived next door to my family. So. As we end this discussion that could go on forever because it's such a significant book that tells layers of stories, not simply about the Jones family, but about the American family. Yeah. I want to ask each of you, what's the one word that you're left with when you close this book? Can I give you three? <laughs> and you aren't even a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Three quick words. Inheritance. The inheritance of sin. What does it mean? Second, imagination. The ability to see beyond the opacity of one's condition. To imagine and otherwise. And third, the gift of insight. So, as I read, read the text, inheritance, imagination, insight. Those three sets me right to do the doing, to get about the business of doing. That's, he is a preacher. I mean, the three <laughs> points, and they all start with the same letter. Alliteration, I mean, right. three on. points. <laughs> Where's our hymn? Where's our invitation right now? Amen. Let's somebody open the doors uh, of the church. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say um, theology comes alive just when we need it. <laughs> I'm singing a song all the time in my head. So I'm singing, I want to I wanna see you be brave. It's so brave. And we need to be brave. So I want to see you be brave. Thank you for inviting us to brave, bravery. Yeah. Thank you. And so the word that comes to my mind after hearing all of you and after reading this book is amen. And to you, it's a must read. And so if nothing else comes from this evening, you are inspired to get a book that you must read and that the nation must have. Thank you, Serene, for Call It Grace. So we invite you, Robin's giving me instructions. Oh, you were going to, were you going to read something from your book? Robin told me I was. <laughs> I do what Robin says, but it's, it's time to read something. Yeah, why don't, you, okay. why don't you read a passage that will send us off to the reception, okay. and, and you may purchase the book. Okay, so I'll, I will just read you one section, and Robin is our um, Vice President for Communications, and we all do exactly as she says. So when she, she says it. When she says it, so um, tomorrow there will be no peace in the office if I don't read this. Um, um, this is a section that begins the last quarter of the book, where I just start laying out my more mature adult, still unformed, but 
emerging theology. And this is uh, just a couple of paragraphs from chapter 10. For me, breath, justice, mercy, and love are the most vivid manifestations and visions of my hungry, urgent theological imagination. When I see God, my imagination beholds the transformative power of these four sacred truths flowing through me and through the world around me. Like this. The world, as I imagine it, is filled with breath, divine spirit, air that moves in and among us, wedding us to one another, making all that lives one fluid breathing organism, expanding and contracting in love. And it is beautiful, not as in pretty or movie star gorgeous, but beautiful in its power to attract and wondrous, wondrously fulfill our ultimate desire for one another and for the flourishing of all. Think beatific. For the flourishing of this all to happen, there must be justice. I don't think of justice as some big Roman measuring instrument where everyone gets equal parts. It's bigger and more beautiful than that. To seek justice is to work to create environments where life and love flourish and the God-created value of each life is cherished. Justice keeps us restless and questing and struggling for the good. For justice's fulfillment usually stands as a distant hope. It's what we strive for, realizing the divinity in each of us and treating each person and the planet as cherished and divine. So we've got breath and justice. Mercy? It's a more complicated word than justice. And it's often confused with bland forgiveness. Mercy is greater than that. It reminds us that as we seek justice, there is no grand God calculator in the sky making sure good is rewarded and evil is punished. Mercy is the promise that divine love ultimately wins and life is fulfilled in God's love despite our brokenness and unfairness. It's something we have a hard time recognizing in our score-keeping lives because it exists in another incomprehensible dimension. It is beyond us and yet defines our lives. And then there's love. For me, the other word for God's love is grace. Grace sums up all these sacred truths in one word. The light that shines on all existence is the light of love from beginning to end. It is the truest reality there is. Our most natural impulse, our core, our creative expression. You don't have to earn it and you can't lose it. It just is God. So we have food and wine and books in the back, and uh, thank you, dear friends, for your words.